Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome everybody to Nightlight. Thanks for joining me tonight. It's going to be an exciting night because I have an amazing person on with me. But first I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for his amazing intro. Seek him out on the internet. He and his wife Deb are native storytellers and their material is fabulous. Please take a look, learn, and be enlightened and informed all at the same time. I have with me tonight Dr. Rita Louise who has written a book, one of many, called The Dysfunctional Dance of the Empath and the Narcissist. It takes an in-depth, in-depth look at the unconscious patterns that keep individuals trapped in cycles of abuse of relationships. It endeavors to raise people's awareness to the ingrained programming going on deep inside and help the reader understand how they keep getting into these situations in the first place. Regardless of what happened to a person when they were young, they have the power to redefine themselves in their life. It's possible to break free of these destructive negative patterns and fully experience the loving, healthy relationship they have always desired. A survivor of childhood abuse herself, Dr. Rita has emerged as a gifted empath and talented clairvoyant medical intuitive. She's a naturopathic physician and the founder of the Institute of Applied Energetics that trains students in the art of medical intuition, intuitive counseling, and energy medicine. She's authored six books, produced several feature-length and short films, and has appeared on radio, television, and in the movies, and has lectured on health and healing, ghosts, intuition, sorry, ancient mysteries, and the paranormal. Her books and articles have worldwide circulation. This is an amazing book. Everybody should read it. Uh, it. It talks about patterns that all of us experience. It talks about, but most importantly, it gives you the tools and the skills, if you choose to, to, re, to repattern yourself, to come to a greater oneness within yourself and, and your reality. So welcome to the show, Dr. Rita. Hey, Barbara, how's it going? Hey, it's going well. It's going well. I had such a fantastic time reading this book. Um, it, it was an eye-opener. And, um, you, you know, you always think, yeah, I know about that stuff, but you don't know about it until you've talked to somebody that's lived through a lot of the experiences. And I think when you're writing about something that you yourself have lived through, it makes it makes what you write and the words it carries it carries so much impact because you know this person has experienced this that it it makes it just so much more real to the reader it's just amazing this is a fabulous book thank you you know and when i was writing it i had so many aha moments you know and i would be researching some concept like attachment uh, style, you know, and it's like, ooh, that, that's what I do, you know, wait a minute, <laughs> what about that, holy crap, you know, 
I mean, something that I'm like, wow, I didn't even know that existed or I knew it existed, but I didn't know that there was like a vocabulary word for that. I just thought that was something weird going on with me. And, and there's even a vocabulary word. Holy crap. So it was <laughs> enlightening and eye opening for me, you know, but I wrote it as part of my healing. You know, because Mm -hmm. as you know, or people that have heard me before, you know, I'm a pretty hardcore researcher. And so as I was researching myself, you know, and researching, well, whatever spirit told me to look at, um, (laughs) you know, and the next rabbit hole to go down, um, you know, I was guided to share that information. You know, and and I do want to put out way up front that, you know, people kind of, when they hear that I was a, you know, a survivor of abuse, this book is not a memoir. Even though there is my story in it, it is not me whining for 330 pages throughout the book. The book is really designed to help people's awareness of who they are, where they came from, what's going on inside, what's going on in their relationships, dynamics. And if they find funky stuff, what can I do to fix it? Yeah, I, I think that one of the first things that, that you wrote about that, uh, that that caught my attention and I went, aha, uh-huh, aha, uh-huh, aha. Uh-huh. I, I mean, there are so many aha uh-huh moments here. Um, the fact that, that w- young children, itty-bitty, teeny-weeny little children, are beginning to notice the behavior of the people around them and, and, and starting to form their own patterns of how they're going to react as life goes on. And I, I think most people don't realize that. They think, you know, well, they're children. They can't possibly, you know, hear us, understand us, or whatever. But, but they are. And I forget how young it was, how, how early these patterns are formed, but it was, it was obscenely young. I mean, there are some that contend that these patterns begin to form before birth, you know, while you're uh-huh. still in utero. Um, you know, but to make it be what you're saying, kind of give it an image, you know, if you're a young child, let's say you're two years old and you, you know, you go near the stove and your mom goes, hot, hot, you know, and then one day you actually touch it and burn your hand, you're not going next to that stove anymore. So that has created a pattern in you that says stove equals hot equals pain. Uh Uh-huh. You know, and so... Well, what about relationships and how people show love? I mean, that that happens very early on as well. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You know, so if you are in a family and your parents are absent or if there's fighting going on all the time or you're not getting the nurturing that you need, you know, because you are a individual, you know, you're going to react, act or react. Um, One of the things that often happens, sorry, but the train is very loud right now. Uh, One of the things (laughs) that often happens is, um, you know, in that desire to feel wanted or needed or loved or nurtured, we do things in order to garner that from our caregivers because they're the ones that give that to us. They're the ones that provide it to us. They create that safe space for us to land, to know that the world is good and the world is safe. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you live in a traumatic household, then you don't necessarily grow up knowing that the world is good and the world is safe. You might be looking for something bad to happen around every corner because your entire time growing up, something bad was around every corner. Yeah, that is so sad. It is sad. But, you know, but most of us, you know, I, I look back at my, my grandmother was a rather formal, cold person. And then my mother was a rather formal, cold person. And for some reason, I turned into a gushy person. But my sister is a rather cold, cold formal person. So, you know, as you get older, as you, you know, as you get, you know, 50 plus, you begin to see the patterns in your family and how they have come down and been overlaid on your life. And and then it's your choice to either change them, switch them, or follow them. Well, you know, sometimes you can see the patterns that are going on. 
And they, or you could be like me and be completely oblivious to it until one day it's like, poof, here's this information, now go deal with it, which is what happened. Yeah. You know, and it was an overload. And it was kind of like, you know, how, how some people have, like, psychic awakenings. And, you know, it, it's like now they have to deal with all of the stuff. And I had to deal with these relationship I mean, I knew they weren't good, but I didn't realize – my role in them <laughs> and how much I kind of brought them yeah. on myself. Yeah, that, that Which is, is the part that is like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, sometimes you have to get hit with that cosmic two-by-four. Yes, and, ma'am. You know, um, and, and, you know, I have splinters in my face from, from being hit by that over over time. And it's not that the universe is angry. It's just that, you know, it, it's sometimes you need to be woken up, and sometimes it takes a shock to wake you up. But um, <coughs> it, it, it's, it, does, it does send you into seeking an answer to the situation. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, you kind of fall into the pattern and you keep going until the pattern is unlivable and then you do something about it. And... You did more than do something about it. Not only did you recognize it and, and you know walk away from it, but but then you figured out what happened and and you figured out a way to fix it, which is the best part. Well, that's what I love about this book. You you've taken the two. Uh, you know, the, you've mentioned the, the title holds two archetypes: the the em, empath and the narcissist. And I just, they are two archetypes, but I want everybody to understand that there are many archetypes. Depending on who you're reading, it can be, you know, 12 or 20 or whatever. So these are just two archetypes that are out there. And, and the, these are the ones that, that Dr. Rita looked into in this book, and they're fascinating. And um, you want to explain the, the two different archetypes, the, the, the empath and the narcissist, and and mm-hmm. and how they're healthy, how they how they are healthy, and and then what they're like when they're not healthy, and and what happens when the two of them get together. Okay, so empaths are individuals who, um, you know, they are highly sensitive individuals, and so they are able to sense and detect what's going on in the space around them. You know, they're just very sensitive, so if they walk into a room, it's very easy for them to feel the vibes. Or if they go up to a friend and they can sense that there might be something wrong, they sense, they feel, you know, they feel sad. You know, they don't necessarily know their friend is sad, but they feel sad. You know, once they start recognizing changes within their body, they'll be like, well, wait a minute, I just was in a good mood, and now I'm sad, but I'm standing next to so-and-so, maybe it's their sadness that I'm picking up, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and so they can have a habit of reacting to energy that's not their energy. Um, You know, sometimes they're referred to as being psychic sponges, you know, and it's not, you know, when you're, when you have empathy, you can put yourself in someone else's shoes, but when you're an empath, there really is kind of a body level picking up of energy or depending on the situation, getting overloaded by the energy. Um, you know, and the, <laughs> my primary example, if you're an empath, um, is, you know, when you have to make those trips to Walmart on a Friday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon and it's packed, and I don't know about other people, but I can last for about 15 minutes. And if I go by myself, I'm kind of wandering around the store aimlessly looking for cat food, and I can't find it because I'm overloaded. You know, there's too much mm-hmm. energy going on. You know, or you go to a concert, and there's just too much energy. And so, you know, it just makes you really disconnect from your own internal stuff, and it's not even yours. Um, you know, people that are empaths tend to be warm and sensitive and loving and compassionate. Um, they, you find them in the helping professions, you know, traditionally like doctors and nurses, but it could be someone who's a mechanic, you know, but it, uh-huh. or a lawyer, you know, because it's really important for them to be of service to other people. <clears throat> 
Now, one of the things that I talk about in the book, and I mean, this is kind of my opinion on it, is that, you know, there are people that come in sensitive, but my feeling is, is that people that become highly, highly empathic um, often experience trauma in their lives, you know, or they are in situations where they need to use their spidey sense in order to survive, you know, and it was interesting, you know, I had that thought, you know, whether that was a true situation. And I went on Facebook and did a survey in a group that's called an empath with like 30,000 people that self-describe as being empath and asked that very question. You know, you know, you say you're an empath, you know, was there trauma and abuse in your family of origin? And I was expecting maybe 50-50, maybe, and it was over 80%. I mean, it was, a, and actually it was over 80%, and I'm just being very kind in saying 80%. You know, there were a handful of people that said, no, you know, my family was good, um, but the bulk of them had severe challenges. Um, uh-huh. You know, because one of the things about being an empath is that you're open to receiving the energy around you. And so if you're in a challenging environment, it's really good to know that, okay, something changed, but it's nonverbal, but I can feel like this bad energy coming off my dad or coming off my mom, or now everything feels really tense, you know, and these shifts in energy make you become aware of what's going on so that you can act appropriately. Or maybe. <laughs> All right, not in my case. Yes. But for most people, they can maybe act appropriately. Um, okay. You know, but when – yeah, I used to get in a lot of trouble for it. So, anyway. Uh, <laughs> you know, but in that, there's wounding. And so what happens with the wounding um, – is that these same individuals can end up with uh, core beliefs that tell them that they're not worthy, that they're stupid, that they're fat, that, you know, and so there's this inner dialogue that does not allow them to be whole and congruent with themselves. And in order for them to, because of this unworthiness, you know, in order to seek love and acceptance and whatever from their family, they will become what is called a people pleaser, you know, and they will do what they need to do for two different reasons. One is in order to get love and nurturing from the family, you know, so if I clean my room really good without being asked, then my mom is going to come in and say, wow, you did a great job. You know, so I'm, go- I'm getting something back for my behavior. Or, you know, mom is drunk over there and I'm just going to go and make dinner and take care of everybody else because that will make it be better, a better situation. Or, uh-huh. you know, and sometimes you don't feel like you have a choice because if you don't take care of everything, then there's going to be some kind of retribution You know, like if you don't go ahead and just make dinner without being asked, then, you know, mom will wake up from her drunken stupor and be mean or whatever. And I I mean, that wasn't my life experience, but I'm just using that as an example. Um, Okay. And so these people can't say no regardless of the inner cost of what's going on. And so it makes it so that it can become very easy to become exhausted because they tend to spend more time taking care of everybody else and not any time taking care of themselves, identifying what they want, what they need, et cetera. Uh The narcissists, on the other hand, are completely opposite. You know, they are, um, well, I think that they also come into the world being very sensitive as well. Um, If the individual has had severe abuse, they could have developed um, what's called narcissistic personality disorder, which is a severe form of narcissism. You know, but there's a lot of um, 
everybody has a certain amount of narcissism in them, you know, because we wouldn't take care of ourselves if we didn't. You know, there wouldn't be any, uh, I can't think of the word. We wouldn't take care of ourselves. And so, but people that have narcissistic characteristics, instead of looking to the other person and wanting to take care of and support the other person, are only looking to themselves and what they want and what they need and use all their energy in, in taking care of them and themselves. Um, and so it's just not really a very healthy situation for anybody to be involved with these individuals, much less a person that's an empath. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, you know, the, do, you, do you think that these two archetypes are drawn to each other to provide the experience for one to recognize it and grow? And if you don't recognize it and grow, then, then it's repeated again and again and again until you figure it out? Well, I don't think narcissists by nature are interested in learning and growing. You know, they're just interested in being and taking. You know, empaths, on the other hand, <laughs> are always looking to grow and are always looking to be better. Um, you know, they're the people that buy the self-help books, <laughs> you know, and watch the YouTube videos where the narcissist is like they know everything. So what do they need to watch the video for? Um, you know, but I feel like they, they reflect each other's deficits. You know, and so the empath doesn't know how to take care of themselves, but the narcissist sure does, you know, and the narcissist doesn't know how to take care of someone else, but the empath does. You know, additionally, you know, narcissists traditionally don't have a lot of light of their own. You know, there's not an internal light where people who are empaths, you know, they shine bright. And, oh, yeah. and I think one of the comments that I made in the book was, you know, they're a tasty morsel for the, uh, the narcissist <laughs> that just happens to be passing by. Uh, yes, yeah, so a little bit of my sarcastic humor did kind of get into the book a little bit. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, but, but, you know, everybody, um, you know, I, I look, you know, of course, I, I, took inventory in, in, the, in the people I know and the people that, you know, I was drawn to in, in the past and stuff. And I can identify, you know, some who were narcissistic and some who were wounded empaths. I mean, and, and yet wounded empaths can get better. They can yeah. uh, change. They can rework their their pathways, their neuro whatevers. And, and come to a, a more stable, healthy place within themselves. So, so in, in a way, the narcissist does help them recognize the fact that there's a need to grow. And if they're strong enough um, to grow, then then in many ways they become a stepping stone to a much healthier place within themselves. Correct. Absolutely correct. Just, you know, I, I think you know. Yeah. If, you know, down the road, it's like you have all these books about, you know, how to get rid of narcissists and, you know, how to heal as an empath or heal and not be stuck in these cycles. And it's like, well, who are the narcissists going to hang around with? Well, <laughs> apparently there's a whole bunch of wounded empaths out there so that um, they, they, there's no... They'll just move on to the um, next one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and because there's no real emotional attachment, it's easy for them to flip person to person to person until they're dr- – you use the term psychic vampire, and I can understand that. It it does. You, they do feed on the anxiety they cause in the other person, which is a sad thing. Well, and I think for them, because they need, you know, the technical term, which was just like, really? Uh <laughs> there were a lot of those really um, was narcissistic supply, you know, because they need narcissistic supply, which is your energy and attention, both positive or negative. It's like 
if I end a relationship with someone who's a narcissist, they have to move on, you know, because it's almost like it's a drug. If they aren't getting that supply, they kind of curl up and wither up into a whole lot of nothing, and they have to be with themselves, and they don't like themselves, you know, because the person that's on the inside is yucky. Well, they, they also have tools that, that are incredible I, because if one is in a relationship with somebody like this, it's, it's, it's very difficult to end the relationship and walk away because they don't let you. You know, it's- I think, you know, I think it really depends on the individual, whether, um, you know, you continue the, rel- well, I have to take that back. You know, I think for many, eventually a line will be drawn. You know, one of the things about narcissists is that they will lie, you know, and so something happens, you know, they cheat on you. And you find out. And so, you know, you're like, "Mm, I'm out of here. You know, don't want to be with you anymore. You know, I'm going to find, go for the door. You know, and then they they have like a come to Jesus meeting. I swear to God, you know, and the light shines through and they see the errors of their ways and they're going to go to counseling with you and, It's all going to be better because they recognize what they've done wrong and they're so sorry they hurt you. And I'll tell you what, they can be freaking believing, you know, and they they just tell you this stuff. And then, you know, like two months later, six months later, however long it is before you catch them again, um, Mm -hmm. it starts this cycle again, you know, and so... The part is to recognize that they're a narcissist, that they're big fat liars, and when they promise to change, to not believe them. But don't, don't impasse. You know, oh. well, don't don't impasse that are wounded. Impasse feel they can they can fix them though. You know. I, I think that some them. of them are. You know, I think that there's also. A group of, well, there's a couple things. You know, depending on where the wounding is, um, Mm -hmm. they're happy that they found someone that likes them in the first place, that they're willing to put up with their crap. Because, well, who else is going to like me or love me or want to be with me? You know, and so they're, that's why I really talk about like looking at your own stuff. Because if you're staying, because you don't think you could find someone else because you don't have enough value to attract someone else, that's really not a good reason to stay in a relationship that's hurtful. That's true. But it happens all the time. I I was just going to say, but, but you know, it it has happened to me uh, from time to time in the past and, I would imagine, you know, most people can relate to that to a degree. I mean, some people not so much, but um, I know that that, that I've been in relationships that, that, you know, I was there because I I figured, you know, nobody else is coming along, so I might as well stick with this person. And then then I realized that this this doesn't feel right. And um, happily, after a while, you see the pattern and you say, oops. You know, when I, I would rather be alone. I can't do this anymore. Than, yeah, yeah, kind of like when yeah. I when when I would rather be alone than be with this person. Then there's something wrong here, and I have to change this, and I have to move on. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I I think a lot of people, though, uh, especially today, they get in a relationship and they just they kind of figure there's you know I have to stick with this because with the way the world is, there's no guarantee someone else is coming along. And the reality well, you is, know, but you know, oh. but I think Go there's ahead. also, you know, we're brought up to, you know, you know, I'm trying to think of the wedding vows, you know, till death do us part, you know, for better or worse, sickness and in health, you know, and so, you know, even those words imply if 
there's bad behavior on one of the people's part that you're supposed to sit there and try to figure out how to work through it. But the part maybe they that could- you know, All right, the part that I no. didn't get, <laughs> the yeah. part that I didn't get was that we're supposed to work through it. Not I'm supposed to work through it or put up with it. It's, it's a yeah. we thing. You know, when you're with a narcissist, it's never a we thing because they don't want to change it. No, and, and you know, you know they, they, they're very comfortable in their own skin there, that's for sure. I, maybe it should be kind of till the death of the relationship instead of till death is to part because... Until I kill you, you mean? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, actually, I've said that from time to time about a relationship. You know, it was a good thing it broke. We we broke up because otherwise I would have killed him. Um, Mm -hmm. But that that does it. It 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 is a reality. Well, with these kind of behaviors, personalities. Is this in our DNA when we're born, or does our environment create them? Great question. You know, I am going to say that our environment, for the most part, um, creates it. You know, and, and this is going to, you know, my last book, Stepping Out of Eden, really talked about how humans became human, you know, and how we as human beings are programmed individuals because humans act humans, but Klingons act Klingons and Romulans act Romulan because the things that we as human value, you know, and the way that we interact as humans is what makes us human, if that made sense. You know, and I think yeah. that some of this behavior you know, is ancient. Thus the archetypes, you know, because archetypes come from deep within our history and deep within the human psyche and the human consciousness. But in my opinion, it's not, you know, some esoteric thing. It's, you know, programming that gets handed down parent to child, parent to child, parent to child, until someone decides to go ahead and change it within a family lineage and and stop the pattern, Mm -hmm. change the pattern. So, but but not every archetype is is able to change the pattern because the narcissist likes where they are. They're well, yeah, they're not the interested in it. Yeah, yeah, they're not interested in changing it. You know, and, and they can't recognize. You know, so I could see someone who's pretty narcissistic reading this book, listening to this interview, and thinking of them thinking of people who are more narcissistic than them and them saying, oh, well, I must be the empath because I know so-and-so and they're more narcissistic yeah. than me. Yeah, that's... And it's true. My friend's, <laughs> my friend's son, who I, you know, said, get this book and read it. You'll see yourself. You'll know what you're in, and it gives you tools to get out. And I, and I didn't say, but I should have. And I may have to go back and say it to him, but for heaven's sakes, don't give it to her because you will turn out to be the narcissist and she will turn out to be the empath. And then you're up the creek without a paddle. Mm-hmm. So I just, but they, would, they wouldn't here. really want to read it anyway, you know, because reading a self-help book means, and especially this one, because it really is about looking inside and facing your uh-huh. inner demons. And they don't want to go there because, you know, inside, you know, the body of every narcissist is a wounded child, you know, and their behaviors are all based on what do I need to do so that you can't see inside of me to find out how broken I am. Yeah. And that that is... um Sometimes it's something that a professional can help you with, and sometimes it's something that if you have the courage to do it yourself, you can. And I, I think that's one of the, the wonderful parts of your book is that, that you know, while you go through the exp- explaining as to how this happens, explaining what these two different archetypes are and what happens when they get together, um, you, mm-hmm. do give the, 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 you do give people the tools, first of all, 
to um, you give checklists. You know, if you're this, 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 and this, then then this is your chances are this is where you are, this is where you fall, and if you're this, 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 and this, then this is where you fall, and and then it then you give tools as as to you know how do I make the changes? How do I work with myself on a deep level to make sure that this is not a pattern that I repeat? And mm-hmm. you know that's. Um, I, I, and and it's I, I think people don't understand reading one self help book or or a hundred will not do you any good unless you are applying what you read to your life and acting upon it. Exactly. You know, having you know having the information in, in your head doesn't do you any good unless you're actually living it, and and that's that's the big part of it. But you do give amazing tools to people as far as you know things you can do and and um let's go through some of them because um i i i found that that you you were so creative with with the, the different tools that you gave people far more than than i had ever even thought of but they do work and and basically they were for the empath you know in in breaking a relation, relationship with a narcissist but Great tools for self development and awareness as well. Oh, exactly. Exactly. You know, so whether you are in a unhealthy relationship or you want to find happiness because, you know, the book really talks about um this relationship dynamic, but kind of the underlying piece to it also is what do I need to do to be happy in my life? Uh-huh. You know, so these tools really apply to that mindset as well, because there's obviously something going on inside of you that is making it so that you're not experiencing happiness. Yeah, and other than I, getting I that Rolls people... Royce, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> most people don't don't really know what real happiness is, to be honest with, you, at least in my opinion. You know, they know. They know, you know, being rich and having lots of toys and all sorts of stuff like that. But, but understanding what bliss is, what just just mm-hmm. pure happiness is, has nothing to do with the toys you have gathered or the money you have in the bank. You know, or our just our ability to just be, you know, yeah. be content with who we are in any moment, even if we're in a crappy situation. You know, standing in line, trying to get our driver's license renewed. You know, (laughs) but we can still be happy in those moments, you know. Um, And I think that that, you know, there is so much stuff. You know, they teach us stuff in school, but they don't teach us anything about ourselves. You know, they don't teach us how to interact with our feelings. They don't teach us how to interact with our brain, you know, and other aspects of ourselves. They don't teach us how to meditate or to deal with um, emotional regulation. You know, something happens and you have a meltdown. It's like, well, what do you do? It's like, well, good luck. (laughs) You know? (laughs) I mean, short of calling your friends up and whining at them, you know, you, you, we're not given any tools. And so we don't really have, uh, you know, an owner's manual to what it's like to be human and to live the human experience. I mean, we maybe can balance our checkbook. Oh, maybe. Um, okay, you know, we can do I basic math. Say, really? <laughs> you know, I know. I, well, that's what came to my mind, but I'm like, okay, maybe not. Um, you know, but we're given tools to do certain things and we might know, you know, the capital of some of the states and we might know where Iran is, um, but, um, but we don't know how to interact with our own feeling self, you know, and I think someone is kind of, you know, in a more advanced class if they understand and can understand what's going on inside and able to deal with and identify their emotions. I mean, that's kind of like 
you know, high school or advanced training that you would think would be kind of a basic thing. I mean, family, our families don't teach it because they never learned it. Um, well, now I just got this whole conspiratorial thing in my head, but okay, I'll just kind of move <laughs> on from that. All right, I'll just say it because it'll just keep coming back and drive me crazy. You know, I wonder if, you know, the programming, um, yeah. they don't teach us that because if they teach us that, then we would be able to come into our own power, and if we're in our own power, then they can't control us. Okay, that's my little conspiratorial put in for the evening. Okay. Well, I, so I that, know that you, as, a, as a parent, I took a look at a lot of this stuff, and you know, I was a single parent, and you know, I take very seriously, you know, took very seriously my responsibility that I give him patterns as best I could that that would be healthy for him. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like I I think most parents, I, I don't know, all I can do is speak for myself. I would think that most parents would, would, would be in that place where it's like, okay, I want him to be healthy with relationship. I want him to be trusting i want him to be kind i want him to be all sorts of wonderful things and and i have to give him the example and i have to give him the the road to follow you know this is what mom was like so therefore this is what i'm going to be like with my children down the road now now i was only 22 when i had him so um i don't think my my um reasoning was as as intellectual as it is right now but but it was like, you know, you you work hard on making sure that you give them the tools that they'll be able to survive with, and it isn't just you know, you know, hit the other guy before they hit you or anything like that. It has to be, you know, life is life is um, an adventure for sure, but you need the tools for it. Um, right, but see, I, the I tools that... I got growing up was how to clean really good. <laughs> Like make sure those baseboards are wiped down and how to cook and how to save money. And, you know, so the great survival tools, I have great built-in survival skills. I will always be able to take care of myself and survive, uh-huh. you know, but anything relationship-wise, eh, not so much. Just wasn't yeah. on their radar. But look at look at where we come from. I mean, um Okay, my my grandmother, I, I almost think, was Victorian and a prude. My mother was not much better. And, you know, society changes as, as you know, the generations evolve. And what was right for one generation just doesn't work for the next generation. And I don't know mm-hmm. what the heck is going on now, to tell you the truth, because, you know, it's totally off the scale as far as I'm concerned. I... I find myself, you know, stepping back and saying, are you kidding me? Um, mm-hmm. You know, somebody found their 16-year-old son having sex with his girlfriend. Now, that would, I would have hit the roof, but they just made sure that he had condoms. So, you know, I don't know if that's generational or if that's environmental or, or, or what it is, but... I mean, I think that, you know, that can break down by family to family. One of uh, my stepsons climbed out his bedroom window at some point in time at night. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, we got a phone call from the police because he and his friends were wandering around on the street, and he told the cop that they were having a sleepover at our house. Right. And um, because there was a curfew going on. And so we get him home. He's already in trouble because he climbed out his bedroom window only to find out. And they were 15, only to find out Uh that the friend took his mother's car and they went and picked up some other kid and they were joyriding all around town. And I was like, well, you're lucky you weren't in the car, and you're lucky the cop didn't stop you in the car because you would all be jailed, and it wouldn't just be a courtesy phone call to come get you 
down the street. And um, so he was grounded. He lost his bedroom door. I mean, he had a lot of consequences to that one because that was just bad. His friend, Uh his parents said, oh, well, if you wanted to learn how to drive, you should have just told us. Ow. I was like, are you kidding me? And that's the kid that took the car. So, so, so this is what they have learned works for them. So you do begin to wonder what happens when they are the parent and how are they going to prepare their children? You know, I, I, and emotionally, I think, you know, the concept of love is really, really important. And, you know, if, if, if you've got that as a background, you know, it's a good start. But sometimes we don't have that as a background. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a parent that is emotionally unavailable and another one who is just, you know, out of it. And, you know, so, so, so how do you cope with this journey of humanity when you have nothing to go on? You know, but that's part of that rediscovering part. You know, I think that, you know, talking about these relationship dynamics, it's like, you know, people end up in them. They end up in harmful situations because that's how their family was. You know, that's how their parents treated each other or they were treated growing up. And they just think that it's normal. You know, but from an external perspective, it's not. And until they come to recognize that it's not or that's not what they want anymore, or they can have better, I mean, sometimes they don't even know they can have more or better. Then they just keep existing day to day based on that. Okay, so how about the person who discovers from reading your book that they are an injured empath, you know, Mm -hmm. full-blown textbook case. Here it is. That's me. That's my relationships to a T. All of them, it repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats. What do I do now? I recognize that it's happened, but what do I do? Well, one of the things that I firmly believe, although there are some people that have not agreed with me, but I kind of don't care because I'll be narcissistic about it. I know I'm right. How's that? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> is, you know, Truthful. it takes two to tango. Truthful. It takes two mm-hmm. to tango, you know, and you can't get in a relationship with an unhealthy person, you know, in a vacuum. You know, so there's some reason that you attracted this person into your life and let them stay and let the abuse continue and not leave the first time a red flag was waved. There's some reason that you allowed it to happen. And so I think the first step is to really take a deep look at yourself, you know, and and what you're bringing to the table or what aren't you bringing to the table as the case may be, so that you can start recognizing, you know, what's going on in you that um, is making you stay. You know, people that are empaths, that are healed empaths, it's like they might attract a narcissist, but they're going to unload them quick, you know, and not be with them for a year, two years, 30 years, you know, they're just going to be like, ah, too much energy, you got to go and move on, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> they love themselves, you know, and they recognize well, yeah, but, that they can do better. But the wounded empath is going to say, but I love them and I know that they're going to change and I can help them change. And if I just love them enough, they'll change and they'll be better. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I mean, I've not been, I've been a lot of things. I've probably been more, I, I, I don't know. I can identify with some of the behavior actually on both sides. But, but mm-hmm. in, in a case like that, how you, you finally recognize, okay, this is hurting me. This is 
not only is it hurting me and preventing me from finding happiness, but if the person has children, I'm giving this pattern to my child, and I know how hurtful it is for me, and I don't want them to have it. So I need to change. And, and of course, one of the big one is get out, run, and, you know, if you have to, move to another state. But, you know, just get away from this person. But in order for me to not repeat that behavior, what do I do with me? I mean, you know, here I am, I'm alone, and I know I attract narcissists. So, you know, I, I, you can't become a hermit and not let people in. That's not healthy either. So what do you do? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I think just by saying, I don't want to do this anymore, you have started with the operative word, I. Mm-hmm. Because in these situations, you're not operating the relationship off of I. You know, it's off of what they want, they need. And so something might happen and it devastates you. And instead of saying, this is hurtful to me and I don't, I don't want to do this anymore, I allow myself to let it continue. Um, you know, and mm-hmm. so taking a look at um, who we are, you know, taking a look at what your self-esteem looks like or your self-worth, you know, so this is, these are the traits of somebody that has healthy self-esteem. I mean, this was kind of like mm-hmm. <laughs> when I read through it, uh, the ability to like and value yourself as a person, the ability to show kindness and compassion towards yourself the ability to recognize your strengths, the ability to make decisions and assert yourself, the ability to move past your mistakes without blaming yourself unjustly, the ability to try new or difficult things, the ability to take time for yourself, the belief that you matter and are good enough, and the notion that you deserve happiness. And so many times the wounded empath has self-esteem or self-worth issues that You know, they get triggered and create a fear response in them and cause them to stay. But once you sit there and go, okay, well, I have these self-worth issues, you know, but but I know that this isn't healthy, you know, then you can start taking the next step of that self evaluation. You know, one of the things that I have found with people that um, really have self-esteem and self-worth issues is they also don't have self-love, you know? And I think Uh for anyone, that's probably one of the best places to start the process because having self-love is not being narcissistic. You know, it is about taking care of yourself. It is about loving yourself. It is about treating Uh you yourself with the same kind of kindness and compassion that you would give to anybody else that you meet on the street. You know, so one of the things that I've also found is that as you're starting to work through this process, something called your inner critic will jump up, you know, so you're sitting there trying to work on your self love and having a higher energy And then your brain is going, yeah, but, you know, you can't do that. Oh, that won't work. Oh, well, you're not smart enough to do that. You know, and and to me, it's kind of like when you hear that inner critic jumping in and devaluing you, you know, Uh let me ask you a question. So if you had a friend that, that said, you know, Oh well, you know, you're you're trying to have a radio show, but you know, you have a really bad personality and I don't think anybody'd want to listen to anything you have to say because you just you know, you're just not smart enough to say anything that anybody'd want to listen to. Now, if somebody said that to you, what what would your reaction to them be? Would you accept it and listen to them, or would you just kind of, you know, flip them the bird and move on? Well, I think there was a time in my life where I would have said, oh, maybe you're right. And now it's like, okay. you know, well, it's your opinion. You're entitled, but I kind of don't agree <laughs> with you, you know. <laughs> okay. You know, but when it's our inner critic, it's like, 
we're saying that stuff to ourselves. And a lot of times we yeah. say stuff that's even worse. That's even oh, yeah. worse that we would not even vocalize out of our mouths to say to somebody else. But when you find yourself in that place of like, rah, 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 become aware of it. Go, wow, listen to how I'm talking to myself. That's really bad. And, and <laughs> stop it. You know, don't talk to me. Okay, so when I started on this process, you know, because my self-love was not that good. And so I was working on this, and I had I saw an ad for a, a estate sale that was fairly close, and I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to go to this estate sale. And I swear to God, I heard this, no, really loud. And I, it kind of freaked me out. And I'm looking around my room going, who the heck just said no? And one, it sounded like my mother, which didn't surprise me at all. And I was just like, <laughs> screw you. If that's just something inside of me that is trying to stop me from doing something that's going to make me happy. I like going to flea markets. I like going to estate sales. It was going to make me happy. And there was this inner critic thing telling me I couldn't do it. You know, then my defiant part jumped down. It's like, fine, screw you. I'm going to the yeah. estate sale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and but I think that awareness of how we're treating ourselves, you know, are we beating ourselves up? Are we depriving ourselves of things that we want or need? Um, are we self-sabotaging things that we're trying to do or creating unrealistic expectations, you know? Maybe we're abusing our body or just not taking care of it um, or making really destructive choices. You know, all of these things are indicators that we're really not loving ourselves, you know, but we're not taught how to do that either, you know, it, but it's about being loving and compassionate to us. It's about, especially as an empath, treating ourselves in the way that we would treat one of our good friends. They're having a bad yeah. day. It's like we go over, we give them a hug, and it's like, you okay? We don't ever do that to ourselves. <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. No, it's, 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 it's an excellent point. And, you know, you, you've listed a lot of things that, that people can try and people can do. And one of the, one of the things that, I have found really, really important for people who are on a journey to finding themselves, a journey to loving themselves, a journey to spirituality. Um, any journey is meditation of some kind or form. And mm -hmm. um, most people who um, hear the word meditation think, well, I'm not going to sit still for hours and go home. And you... You, you you had a lot of amazing examples of what meditation is that, you know, um, that, that would give most people, you know, okay, so, so you aren't going to do yoga or you aren't going to do tai chi or you aren't going to do formal-led meditations. Um, I did needlepoint for the longest time, mm -hmm. and that was my meditation. It was a repetitive action. My brain turned off. My... Spirit talked to me. That's where I got inspiration. That's where I found all sorts of wonderful stuff. It's it's a matter of focusing on something to the exclusion of everything else. And you even said, you know, you can do this raking leaves. Just, I love raking leaves. You know. Well, my new thing is fishing. Okay. My friends are like fishing. And it's like, yeah, fishing, because you go, I mean, my boyfriend and I bought a boat. And, um, you know, we just go out on the lake. It's a crappy boat, but it's our, it's our yacht. And, okay. And we go out on the lake, and I, you know, I like bait fishing because you just put, like, the fish or I do shrimp or hot dogs on the end, and you mm -hmm. throw it in the water, and you just sit there, and you just kind of watch your bobber waiting for a fish to maybe bite. And you're out yeah. in nature, and you're just sitting there not doing anything. There's no work. There's no laundry. There's nothing. There's just you. 
and the boat and the bobber. Yeah. So, so it, it's it. really important for, for, for people to understand that, that it doesn't have to be a formal form of meditation. It, it just is a time where you're letting yourself go and not thinking. And well, and I'll, I'm going to put it into a different perspective because this was a really interesting concept that came through. You know, so okay. in our brain, we can only have one thought at a time. Just one. Uh-huh. Now, there might be hundreds of thoughts all competing for that one thought, but we can only have one primary thought. And so we can have a good thought or we can have a bad thought. So when we meditate, you know, it's not about what you do. It's all about how you do it. You know, so meditation uh-huh. is about doing something, okay, and it can be anything. So it, it really is something that you are filling that one empty slot with a thought. You know, so for me, going fishing, I just am watching my bobber going, come on, fishy, fishy. I talk to the fish. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Jump on my sure. little hooky thing. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm um, sure it helps a lot. No, it doesn't, but it's still fun. Right. <laughs> um, you know, or if you're raking leaves, you know, and it's just, you know, getting OC about getting that last little leaf piece over. If you're doing needlepoint, I mean, that really takes a lot of concentration. But that one brain cell, that one slot is filled with that task. You know, and it might not start filled with that task, but as you allow yourself to become engrossed in it, it will be filled with that task. I I think a lot of people have had the experience where they've gone to the gym, you know, they're in a crappy mood, and they go to the gym and they have a really vigorous workout, and they leave and they feel really good, and the things that were bothering them or were worrying them are just gone. You know, washing dishes, cleaning a bathtub, it really doesn't matter. The goal is to fill that slot. Yeah, and let, let's also, you know, give the guys something because taking apart an engine and putting it back together, doing a woodworking thing, putting up drywall and sanding it and stuff like that, playing golf, um, you know, these are areas where you're focusing on something and and it's to the exclusion of everything else, which, you know, it, it's a wonderful experience. And sometimes people just, you know, they go, ick, meditation. But, but I think everybody actually has done it at some point in time during the day for a short period of time. And if you can just expand it a little bit, it gives your consciousness a chance to actually come into a better balance. Mm-hmm. Really I mean, I think everyone has meditated, you know, in, in that viewpoint at some point in time. Doing very, so... You know, sitting on the mountaintop in a lotus position, you know, is a very passive form of meditation. But even in Uh those types of meditations, the concept is you pay attention to your breath. So you're filling that one slot with paying attention to your breath. Or you repeat a mantra. So that slot is being filled with repeating a mantra. Um, I find it very boring. Personally, I mean, it's okay sometimes, uh, <laughs> but I'm a pretty energetic person, and I find that especially if there's something that's bothering me, I just as soon go burn it off. Let me go move a wood pile or something. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have a huge garden, and I love to weed the garden. I just mm-hmm. love, you know finding the weeds and pulling them out and giving the, the plant space to breathe and, you know, that, that whole thing. That, that, to me, is an amazing meditation. And, and you always feel better. I mean, maybe a little stiff, but you always energetically feel, feel charged because you've done something and, and it, 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 it made you feel more blissful. And, and I think mm-hmm. that... that you know, I, I encourage people to find a way or ways that um, that they that they do a meditation of some sort each day. Um, I have a friend who loves to clean, 
and you know I think she's crazy, but she loves to clean, and that is for her a meditation. I'm sure. Um, she's got lots of people and lots of animals in her house, so there's always a reason to to do something. But um, uh, not for me, but for her, it, and, and it is individual. And if you find something that is unique unto yourself, that's very appropriate too. Um, and trying. But to, I'm going to put a little know, caveat in there. If you sure. find something that you like to do, and I'll use the cleaning, you know, because for me, cleaning can be very meditative. And I can get really OC when I get into that place. Um, and, you know, there's like not one little speck of anything anywhere because I have scrubbed it to death. Thank you, Mom. And, um, <laughs> But if there's something that you think you're doing because it is a practice, you know, and what comes to more to mind is going to the gym, doing yoga, uh-huh. something where you are doing something for a reason, and now it has become a chore. You know, you're forcing yourself to get up to go, and if you don't go to the gym, you're beating yourself up. It's like, ah, oh, you know you just were so lazy today and blah, 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 then you're not, I mean, you're still going to get the benefit out of it, but are you really creating health out of it or is Uh there harm coming from it because now you're invalidating yourself and it's not a self-loving tool anymore. It's almost like you're doing it out of punishment. Right, that there's resentment, yeah. Right. You know, no, so people have sense. to be careful about that a little bit. Well, especially when you're on, you know, this this journey of self-love and this journey of changing your patterns. Another one of the tools that you suggested, which I, I absolutely, I think I probably suggested to everybody I come in contact with given half a chance, is journaling. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and for yeah. me, anyhow... It has to be pen and paper. It can't be on the computer. It has to be, you know, and and, and that's not the case for everybody, but I know for me, the journaling is more appropriate if I'm writing it out by hand rather than typing it onto the computer. But, you know. I can't understand how someone can journal on a computer, to be honest, to get the therapeutic piece to it. I mean, you can go blah, 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 blah on the computer, but I don't, I don't get that part. Never have. Um, you know, so for people that are, aren't familiar with the concept of journaling, journaling is where you, I'll say, document your thoughts uh-huh. and emotions. You know, so you can journal about anything. You know, we've been doing all this fishing stuff, so now my boyfriend will journal about our fishing outings, how many fish we caught, where we caught them, what the water temperature was, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> it's like he's big on documenting. And I'm like, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but okay. you can use that same t- tool to emote. You know, so if there's something that's bothering you, you can use it to in, you know, to kind of let go of what's going on on the inside. You know, well, why was I thinking that? Well, you know, what was I feeling? And what I have found is that once you start, it has a flow to it, and it will keep going like you're getting some kind of a download until you're done or until that, oh, that yeah. thread is done. Um, You know, so whether that be a couple of paragraphs, a couple of pages, you know, there's not any um, rules to it. You know, my favorite part Uh is spelling is totally optional and decent handwriting. (laughs) Good luck. Oh, yeah. Um, And, (laughs) but, you know, in addition to the therapeutic act where you can sit there and kind of tap into your subconscious, it is also very meditative at the same time. Uh You know, it can kind of take you to a deeper place within yourself um, and help you to understand some of what's going on because sometimes you might start over here with like, 
oh, well, I just had a bad day at work and blah, blah, blah. And this person, and you're, you start off whining, and then the next thing you know, it's kind of like, oh, but, you know, I did do this. And, you know, and, and you might uncover some of that unconscious motivation or unconscious beliefs that are keeping you trapped in a relationship or being triggered by situations that um, are – that are happening around you that might not, that may or may not be true situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, so. I have found, I love journaling. And, and for me, journaling often turns into channeling where, where I, I almost talk to myself in, in a wiser voice. <laughs> I don't always listen, <laughs> but, but it, but it, it sounds pretty. <laughs> But I, uh-huh. I I love journaling. Journaling is is actually uh, one of my favorite things to do. And <clears throat> but but one of the other tools about you know getting on to a better life, a, a a healthier life. You talk you talk about smudging, which I thought was was fascinating as well. Mhm. Well, I mean, I in that section I talk about ritual purification. I love that yes. term, even though most people go, right? Um, you know, but it is, it, ritual purification it has been used by every culture on the planet, you know, and it is still uh-huh. being used today. Um, you know, if you, I mean, I was brought up Catholic, and so if you went to church, you know, there was baptism. You know, I guess most Christian churches do baptism, every church, <laughs> indigenous or Western baptize, you know, where at some point in time yeah. water is sprinkled over the child in order to clear any bad mojo from the infant. Okay. Um, uh-huh. You know, and so one form of a different form, so that's water purification. And I give this whole uh, procedure if you want to clear your house where you can use water to raise the vibration in your environment. Um, You know, but a different one is the use of smoke to, again, clear energy out and raise the vibration. Um, You know, but they both are ritual purification tools. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, used by every culture on the planet. So somebody must be knowing what they're doing because we've been doing it for thousands of years. Absolutely. Yeah, I would I would when doing smudging if you've never done it be be really careful um only in that the the one time I really got excited about it I somebody had given me a huge smudge stick and I had never smudged the house before so I lit it up and got it smoking and I went around all the doors and all the windows and everything filled the house with smoke set off the alarm the uh, police and the fire department arrived, and of course I opened the door and the smoke just billowed out. <laughs> and you know, they looked at me and I said yes, and they said your alarm is going off. And I said yeah, I shut it down. And you know, your house is on fire. No, it's not. I was smudging. You were what? I was getting rid of the bad energy. Now we have neighbors out there too. So. Um, so the policeman saw the smudge stick in my hand and took it out of my hand and said, is this what you were doing? And I said, yeah, I'm getting rid of bad energy. And he said, I'll get rid of this for you. And I said, no, no, I need that so I can smudge again. And he looked at me and said, no, no, you're done. And, you know, <laughs> then the policeman and the fire trucks all left, and I was told never to smudge again. I got smaller smudge sticks, though, after that. But they they never go out. <laughs> Well, you know, I had a similar situation happen, except I didn't have the police and fire department come, thank God. Um, But my house is so full of smoke, now I'm gagging in the house, and it's like, well, you know, maybe I better open some windows and, you know, open the door and go outside, and I stepped outside, and it was just like, all this smoke came out, and I'm like, well, no wonder I'm gagging, because it's really smoky in there. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, it a little goes good. a long way. Oh, it smelled great. Yes, it does. Oh, oh yeah. No, it was it was 
fabulous. I mean, the neighbors, you know, that was when they began to think I was a little strange. Um, and I did other things that, that confirmed it as the years went by. But, you know, it was just kind of like I thought our house needed to be cleansed, and so I, I cleansed it so good um, that that we never – well, I did I did smudge, but I, I – did it a little a little easier the next few times I did it, but but that is one way of of clearing energy, and and it does clear the energy. It really does. Mm-hmm. Um, another great thing to, to do is to have um, I have sea salt lamps all around my house, and um, I love them. They put out negative ne- negative ions, and um, you know people always say, oh, it's so calm in here, it's so peaceful in here, and and you know, I didn't really connect the dots until I realized I've got sea salt all over the place here, and that's got to be part of what's happening. People come in and they're just sort of mellowed out, and um, it, it you can do that with your environment, so it helps you find the peace inside yourself. Mhm. I mean, and, I think and, and my favorite is working with the water. You know, people think uh-huh. I'm nuts, but I'm like, no. And what I do is I get like a spritzer bottle, you know, like a Windex type sh- 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 bottle, except the yeah. new one that I save just for cleansing. And mm-hmm. I'll put like some essential oils in it because I like stinky water and maybe a couple of crystals depending on what my mood is. And there really isn't a right or wrong. You know, the basis is the water. And then if you want to bump it up, bump it up. It's all good. Mm-hmm. And I will, starting in one corner of the room, kind of circle around the edges of a room and at the same time have a visualization that there's a giant bathtub drain going down to the center of the planet. And as I'm spraying, because it's water, you know, I'm imagining that the water is just you know when you clean the shower in your bathtub, and I mean, I use soft scrub, and I scrub the tile, and then you take the water, and you run the water on the wall, and then you look down in the tub, and it's just all coming down black and nasty, and you're like, oh, my God, I was taking a shower in here. So you know what I'm talking about? So I just imagine... You know, so I just imagine as I'm spraying this water, it's kind of like spraying the wall in my bathtub, and then any of that dirt that's stuck on the wall is coming down. Mm -hmm. And I literally will circle and circle, making smaller circles until I get to the center of the room so that I have misted the entire room. I'll miss the furniture if I feel like it's kind of funky, Um, and then move on to the next room, you know, and just go on and do whatever seems like it needs happening. And uh, Mm -hmm. I find it very uh, purifying. I I think that it's it's important for people to hopefully gather um, that it's it's very appropriate to create your own rituals for, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever works with you. I mean, you know, we've shared a couple that we've done, um, some intelligently, some not so. And, uh, you know, it's it's a matter of understanding that this is your space, your energy, and whatever works for your energy is appropriate so long as it doesn't cross your moral judgment or it's not against the law, you know. Mm -hmm. Be conservative. But but it's Well, one of the things that I I talk about, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You know, one of the things that I talk about in the book, and I think everyone, you know, in this section, and I think everyone has experienced this at some point in time in their lives, you know, and I call it spring cleaning, you know, but it's when you go in and, you know, empty all the drawers in your dressers and, and reorganize them and clean out the closet and move the furniture and clean all the dust and dirt from underneath the furniture and wash the windows and wipe down the pictures and the mirrors and and just really clean it like a deep, deep clean, which sounds like a pain in the butt. But Mm. in hindsight, you know, when, when, and I'm just kind of putting this out there for the listeners, 
when you have done that, have you ever checked in to see how your house felt to you? Did it feel uh-huh. better to you? Because these other things that we're talking about, I mean, in spring cleaning is a way to get rid of stagnant energy, but smudging or using the water bottle thing, you know, are a way of shifting the energy and raising the vibration. And so if you've noticed in cleaning out your anxiety closets, you know, or whatever, scrubbing your kitchen down, that it feels better. That's what we're talking about in doing some of these things is that your space feels better. And if your space feels better, we feel better and we can relax more and unload more and be more congruent and whole with ourselves. And not only that, but when you're doing that to your exterior, there is also a level of it's happening on your interior as well. I mean, as hard as you may may be scrubbing walls and floors, um, there's the essence of, um, you know, there's an unconscious reorganization going on internally as well. I know... um, I, I was getting ready for to move, for to move, um, and, and I've been getting ready for the last year. But but part of it was decluttering and letting go of stuff that no longer felt appropriate. And I have to admit that was the most therapeutic thing I have done in years. I literally said, if it's not functional at this moment in time for me, it's not necessary in my life. And they opened a special wing at at Goodwill for my stuff. I I just dumped (laughs) so much there. And and I didn't miss any of it. I, to this day, haven't missed anything. And yet so much stuff went out of this house. It was like, don't need it, don't want it anymore. I haven't used it in years. I haven't worn it in years. You know, it was a matter of just decluttering, and it was it was the most enlightening thing that I have done in a very long time. I mean, I really, you know, became slightly fanatical about it to the point where... But I felt you know, that it I felt have, good after. Oh, it felt so good. I just felt so much lighter that I wasn't carrying all of this external stuff that, that didn't work for me. And at the same time, there was that inner realization that... Emotionally, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have some things that I can let go of that I've been carrying for a very long time, too. I mean, mm-hmm. my best example of, of that is when my, when my mother died, my sister and I had, a, you know, a childhood where, you know, we weren't re- real, real close. But, you know, we loved each other, but we just weren't close. And we did this, she's a shaman, and so we did this, you know, I forgive you for this and I forgive you for this. And we cleared the... the the table so that so that we did become friends after mom passed but one of the things she forgave me for which i couldn't believe she had carried for like 60 years she said i forgive you for cutting my pigtail off when i was four years old and i just looked at her i said you must be joking or scraping the bottom of the barrel um because it never occurred to me that she had held that against me for that many years, you know? Mm-hmm. So so I think there are things that we hold on to that 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 we don't let go of. Um, we, we just don't think about the fact that we don't have to have them in our consciousness anymore, but they're a part of us, so why not, you know, continue to carry them? But you don't have to. Mm-hmm. And... And if something is in the past, it's foolish to keep carrying it because you can't do anything about it. It's in the past. But, you know, and I've had a lot of people, or not a lot of people, I've had some people uh, say to me, well, just let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> it's just like that. And, you know, I can't speak for everyone, but I feel comfortable in speaking for individuals who uh, experienced a lot of trauma is that it's just not that easy to let it go. You know, so if you're listening to the show and someone's saying that to you, it's not that easy to let it go, you know, and it's not that you can't, 
You know, but what happens is that that programming creates inside of you knee-jerk reactions. You know, so uh-huh. if this happens, then what my unconscious is telling me is that there, what is what the next step is is over there. You know, uh-huh. but that might not be the reality of the next step or the reality of the situation, but because it's happened so many times and many times we were very young, that it's an unconscious reaction that happens and it gets triggered. And so until you can start addressing some of these things that trigger you and start healing them, it's not about letting it go because you don't even know what the one it is. And, uh-huh. it, you know, it's just deeper. It, it's just changing really who you are and what you think about yourself or what you think the cause and effect relationship is. Like, well, what do you, if, what, if, you, what, do you, what do you do with those situations when you know you have a knee-jerk reaction and, 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 you know, what do you do? I mean, by the time you recognize it, you've already jerked. But that's okay. I mean, it really okay. is okay. You know, it's okay to jerk. What the goal is is to recognize that you've jerked and to look at the jerk and say, okay, so what button got pushed in me? Mm-hmm. And... You know, and start analyzing it or understanding what happened so that you can start to change it or change the belief tied to it Um, so that when it happens again, maybe it's not so reactive. Or the other part is if you do react to it, your ability to recover from it, you know, so if you said to me, oh, well, Dr. Rudy, you're fat, you know, and if I had these big issues about being fat, then I would sit there and have a reaction to it. Um, Uh But as I started healing myself, instead of the reaction, like putting me as a basket case for a week, you know, maybe it only is bothering me for a little bit, you know, And, and the appropriate response might be, you know, I'm just going to use myself. So, and and and, and okay. you're going to laugh, and and people are going to be like, "What?" So, <laughs> I mean, and I I think I've shared the story with you that when I was young, I was very shy and didn't really talk, you know, and uh-huh. it was excruciating to communicate. And so, as an adult in my relationships that inability to use my words uh, rears this ugly head, you know? And so my knee-jerk reaction, this happens, I'm upset. So instead of saying to you, well, that was really me calling me fat, you know, I'll just go off and brood and just have my little reaction over there and just be in my little funky space, you know? So the healing aspect for me has been, okay, you said something, you know, and I don't even necessarily know what you said, but I find myself over there reacting, you know, so I'm aware I'm reacting to what happened. And so now instead of like rooting for a week, I know that the appropriate thing for me to do is to come back and actually use my words, you know, so you start learning healthier ways of responding So that you can go and go not be over there for a week and maybe be over there for an hour, a couple of hours, and then get back. You know, so it's a process. It's a journey. It's not a, you know, it's fixed in five minute kind of thing, even though that would be so freaking nice. (laughs) (laughs) Then you wouldn't have a book. Um, no, I, I, yeah, as a child, I was very, very quiet, too. I was afraid to speak. And even when in school we did the, um, you know, the oral book reports and stuff, I was always sick on those days. And mm-hmm. it, got, it, got, it got to a point where um, 
you know, if if I was going to have to stand up and be noticed or speak out loud or, or whatever, um, I just clammed up. Now, as to the real cause of it, I'm not real sure. It, it probably has something to do with very early childhood. But I do know that at some point in time, I said, this is ridiculous, I have words. And, and you know, now I do radio shows and I don't shut up. So... You know, same here. What's with that? <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny, because because people who knew me as a very young child kind of just said, you know, I'm not sure what happened to you, but somebody you know turned you on, and you've never shut up, and it's true. But I think there was a fear of speaking, yeah, a fear of putting my thoughts, my words, my feelings out there, whether it was for some stupid book I had read or. You know, just just putting me in front of a group of people or whatever, that fear, um, depending on what the situation is. I, I know that uh, I did a, a TV show once, and I forget who it was. That it, it was some old star from a, a, an old, you know, it, it was a, somebody who had been on TV, a sitcom or whatever, and we were in the green room together, and I said to him, because it was only my second or third time, I said, when do the butterflies go away? And he looked at me and he said, I'll let you know if it ever happens. So that a certain amount of nerves is a fine and appropriate. And, you know, he taught me something that day. It was like, you know, you get started and then the butterflies do go away, but you have to actually open your mouth and get started. So, mm-hmm. uh, amazing lesson. But, uh, you know, we do get them in the weirdest of places in the most unusual of ways. But... Well, and I think you bring up a really great point is the fact that we get stuck in these patterns, uh, dysfunctional patterns, whether it's, you know, with everyone, you know, like your fear of speaking, you know, or your inability to speak or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, Mm -hmm. because we're afraid of something. You know, if I say something, maybe they won't love me. Or if I say something... They're going to think that I'm stupid. Or if I say, they don't really care what I have to say. I mean, there could be a myriad of reasons why you choose to not say say anything. But the bottom line, and this crosses across everything, is that there's a fear that sits underneath that that keeps you from being out there and expressing yourself and being congruent with who you are. You know, so I'm going to give an example because it makes me laugh, you know. (laughs) So I think we have all had friends who, if you get them on the phone, you know, and I'm not saying all of our friends or people we know. How's that? People we know, you know, and you get them on the phone or you're at work and they just are like, blah, 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 blah. You know, and a half hour goes by and you're like sitting there going, oh, my God, I just got to get out of there, you know. Uh-huh. You know, those kind of people, right? Oh, yeah. Or you've had experiences with those kind of people. And so our fear, you know, I'm just using this as an example, not to really bash on those people. Our fear is, you know, if I say you know, well, I have to go or cut them off, Um, you know, maybe that'll hurt their feelings. I mean, there's something going on, you know, so internally, because see, it's all about that internal. Internally, we're like, God, I wish they would shut up. Oh, my God, they're bringing up that story again, not that story again. You know, and so there's all this stuff going on inside of us, but we're not honoring loving and respecting ourselves enough to say, you know, you already told me that story and I gotta go to the bathroom now and then you escape. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, that that's true. And, you know, sometimes you'll be in a position like that and when you recognize there's fear there, then then it's easy to say, okay, I'm afraid of something happening here. There is nothing to be afraid of, so maybe I should just open my mouth and and graciously, you know, go to the bathroom or answer the door or whatever it is. Whatever, whatever it is. 
Yeah. But but you know, it's it's um it is I think I find it these days when I feel resistance, I I usually look and make sure that it's not illegal or immoral. And and if it's not either of those, it's like, okay, if I have a fear about this, um, it's probably irrational. And let me, you know, I do the internal analyzation where I, I used to just respond. Now it's like, okay, so what is triggering this? You know, and I, I, I may look like I'm just not there for a while, but it's like, let me let me figure this out. Let me see if I can change this because this is inappropriate for me, and and I want to handle it in a better way. And you know, and, sometimes and, it and actually you know, works. And I think what I was talking about before about things getting triggered inside of us and making different choices, more informed choices, falls exactly with that too. You know, it's the same kind of methodology that we need to employ to kind of unwind what's going on and separate out what truth is from our Mm -hmm. preconceived, screwed up, fantasy notions of what maybe could happen. I mean, you know, this guy could come crashing in. It could happen. But should we make that stop us from doing what we need or want? You know, for me, you know, it's interesting. Um, Did I ever tell you the story of when I started my radio show? No, I don't think so. So, I mean, this was years ago. I had already been, you know, doing radio interviews on other people's shows. And I get this internal message. It's time. And I'm like, hmm, okay, <laughs> time for what? Don't know if I want to ask, but time for what? It's like time to have a radio show. You know, and I was, and I just was like, Right. I don't even know what I would talk about on this show, much less, you know, like, uh, so I argued for, you know, a day. And Uh then I'm like, okay, so what do you want me to do? Because it scared the crap out of me. But I have come to learn if there's something that's scaring me, it means that I just need to look at it and go, "Hmm, I'm afraid. Okay. I'm afraid, mm-hmm. and just move on, you know, and then they, like, download, oh, well, you know, it has to be a two-hour show, you have to have the show the first Thursday of January of that upcoming year, you have to have a website up, I mean, they were just like, can you can you be a little bit more specific, but I got it all done. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it is amazing, I, there was, I forget exactly where I heard it, um, it's not my story. It's an it's a uh, it's somebody else's, but I can't remember whose. It's the story of a a little chicken, in an itty bitty little chicken in the in the barnyard, and, and it was laying on its back with its feet in the air, and all the big chickens came around and said, "What are you doing?" And you know they 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 all got together and figured the chicken was probably crazy. But but they decided you know let's let's go and ask and so you know one of the roosters went up and looked down at the chicken and said what are you doing <laughs> and the little chicken said I heard the sky was falling and the rooster said okay and the little chicken said and and I'm gonna hold it up and the rooster looked down at him and said you realize you can't hold the whole sky up don't you. And the little chicken looked at the rooster and said, but I can do my best. And Hmm. I often compare myself to the chicken, you know, not that I think the sky is falling, but, you know, my philosophy to me is do your best. Nobody expects more Mm -hmm. of that, of you than that. Just do your best. And if it's not good good enough for them, then, you know, they don't need to listen, you know, as far as the radio show goes or, or anything else. It's kind of like... I do my best, and and um, it's good enough for me. But well, you know, but that's a mentality. That's a mentality that some people really have. You know, in everything mm-hmm. they do, they strive to do their best. 
And then there's this whole other mentality where, ah, uh, well, you know, I did something and, and there's not this inner pride. I don't even know what to call it. Um, where, you know, they do something, but it's not mm-hmm. to the best of their ability. And I, and I personally don't resonate with that. You know, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it yeah. right or as right as I can make it come out. But I guess well, everybody doesn't know, do that. No, some people do it half-heartedly, but I think when they do things half-heartedly, it doesn't mean anything to them. And and so it's a matter of, um, you know, if you don't, if you get involved in something, do it with, you know, both sleeves rolled up and the commitment to do your best. And But if you just get, sometimes people get dragged into situations, and you can tell the ones that are dragged in. It's like um, mm-hmm. people who get dragged to psychic fairs. They don't want a reading, but everybody pushes them for one, and then then you have a bad experience. So it, it's a matter of, you know, standing up for yourself, among other things. And and I think mm-hmm. that that um, your book certainly does give people the understanding that that self worth, self love, standing up for yourself, you know, knowing what you deserve is is the best and if that situation isn't the best then move on and lots of times you know getting back to the the empath and the narcissist you know the the empath you know wants to be a good guy or a good girl and not hurt the other person and you know that's just that's just whipped cream and the cherry on top to the narcissist who is going to you know gobble it all up and ask for more so it's it's a matter of understanding what you're worth and if that's all you think you're worth then you'll stay there until you decide that you're worth more i guess see i Mm -hmm. I have a terrible time understanding somebody putting up with that kind of stuff and yet i know that in my past i have done that myself um i was i was a long time ago with um an alcoholic and and you know it, the, the marriage ended because he was an alcoholic and I remember saying to myself um, several years later I wonder if knowing what I know about alcoholism I could have handled the situation better you know stupid thing to say out loud because the universe immediately sent me another alcoholic and um, I found <laughs> that it didn't matter how much I knew about it the result was going to be the same so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like paying attention and knowing you deserve all the love in the world. And, and, you know, if you settle for less, then you can't get it. And it's a matter mm-hmm. of needing to move on. And, you know, I, I just think that your book had so many aha moments will have so many aha moments for anybody who reads it because, you know, there are pieces of all of us in there, no matter what our archetype is that we have, you know, come into this world that that has, you know, we have labeled ourselves as or, or been labeled by. Um, there, there are so many little technicalities there that apply to everybody and certainly the different forms of meditation, the way to you know, get yourself back in the flow of being with other people and trying new things and and stretching yourself beyond what you, you know, this doesn't mean you do skydiving and bungee jumping. It means that you try things that you, you know, have always wanted to and have never done. Um, finding the love inside of yourself and finding the self-worth doesn't cost money. It just costs time. And it's worth it's worth expanding the time to find it. Mhm. And you know, you're you're a good example of that. And and I think it took a lot of courage to put your own stuff down there on paper to um Oh, I mean, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and I went to start the book and you know, cuz they just said, "Oh, you need to write a book." And then of course, because they tend to be very specific with me, and they said, mm-hmm. Oh, and the first thing you need to write about is your story. And I'm like, oh. 
<laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, but I have to tell you, um, when you come from a, a challenged family, a dysfunctional family, um, mm-hmm. there's there's shame. You know, you don't want people to know. You don't want people to know that your family was screwed up and you're probably screwed up and, you know, you had to work through this stuff because it's just not what people talk about. And I found sharing my story um, on some levels really freeing to just put it out there, you know, and, and, you know, but then it's kind of like, okay, well now everybody knows that I'm screwed up, but, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, but I'm screwed up in a really good way. No. (laughs) Well, it, it it led you to self-discovery, which is really important. I think, I think a lot of people, especially in, in, in the healing field, um, come from places of pain, um, come Mm -hmm. from places where where there's been trauma, and their sensitivity is honed by that. And they can either take that sensitivity and, and, and help other people to understand themselves or, you know, or, or not. But, but I, the more I speak to other people that are in, in, in the arts, uh, so to speak, that they everybody has a story to tell and it it's it's really it's incredible to in many ways find out you're not alone you know i mm-hmm. struggled to get here and 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 yeah um getting to know yourself getting to love yourself getting to be um part of of an emotionality that is healthier for you means um you can then turn around and, and help other people, you, you can't necessarily wave a wand and heal them. I usually tell people my wand is in the shop. But, but you know, you can help them recognize the different um, signs that, that they need to work on themselves and help them to find what is appropriate for them and how to work on it. I think the biggest message for everybody these days is, you know, you have to go within and fix yourself first, and then you can find the happiness and joy that you deserve. And most people exactly. just look at you like you're crazy. And and but it's because it's they don't teach us that. You know, it's our job to make ourselves happy. You know, yeah. we're, we always think that you know we're supposed to find that in the arms of someone else, and ah. that's not the case. <laughs> No. Um, you know, it, you know, we're supposed to take care of ourselves, love ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's one of the reasons that we end up getting so off course is that we don't realize that. Well, it, it takes some maturity, I think, to, to actually fully discover it and be aware of it. Um, you know, when we're young, we're, we're handed the fairy tale and we expect, you know, I, when I was in high school and college, you know, go to college, get married, have children, be a mom, and that was it. And, you know, at some point I, I began to realize that that was not what it was going to be for me and I didn't want that. So, but but it's, it, you're given this, this pattern and, and you're, you you live your life by it until you have the power to take over your own life and and start to move in the directions that are most appropriate for you, and mm-hmm. you know then then everything becomes crazy. But sure, I I, th- I think everybody has to be screwed up in order to find the right path, and some people are just more screwed up than others, so it takes longer for them to unscrew the screws. You know the screws, but. But they do turn out to be much more interesting people. Oh, absolutely. Just saying. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, um, it, it's kind of like um, growing up, my family always had boats. And, you know, some were big, some were little. But, you know, and you found that the only thing boat owners, whether it's sail or power, the only thing they really ever talk about 
is the messes they got in or the difficulties they had. They don't talk about, well, it was a lovely day cruising and we anchored and we had dinner. No, it was, you know, the prop fell off, the engine blew up, we hit a sandbar. It, it was. It's always, you know, the difficulties that that are the important part of the whole experience, and I think that's with life, too. You know, if you can outlive your difficulties and, and you know, find find a better whole or self inside of them, those are the wonderful things. It's the journey not arriving that's important. And mm-hmm. you've, you've given people a wonderful roadmap in, in this book especially. I mean, everybody should read it. It is just you'll find yourself, you'll find your friends, and and you'll probably give it as gifts. I, I know tons of people that are going to get this for Christmas from me. So um, okay. they may not talk to me after a while, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we get much further along, I do want to, you know, you to give out your website and your books and all of the stuff that you do so people can find you and, and experience you. Sure. So my webpage is soulhealer.com, S-O-U-L-H-E-A-L-E-R.com. The Dysfunctional Dance of the Empath and Narcissist is available at all your major booksellers. It is available also on Kindle at a bunch of different places or, you know, Nook or whatever the format is that you need. Um, If anyone listening is interested in getting an autograph copy, um, they would need to order it directly from my website, soulhealer.com, any book ordered from my website. I don't have Amazon Prime, so I can't offer free shipping, so I can't sell it as cheap as Amazon, but it does come signed. So I do encourage people to get a copy from me because it comes signed. And yeah. um, And I just hope that it helps them to – you know, move past their own stuff so that they can be happy, you know, whether it's happy in in a relationship with someone else or be happy in a relationship with themselves. Yeah, I I think one of the the things that we haven't actually mentioned that I think is really important in this entire process is it's important to have a sense of humor. If, Mm -hmm. If you can't laugh, at yourself especially, um, then then the journey is a harder one. It doesn't mean you can't you can't make it, but a sense of humor enables you to to um, follow a lot of um, the pathways that are there for you. And the more you do it with mm-hmm. laughter, the easier it is. Um, you know, we we have joked a lot about a lot of the difficulties that you know we've had or other people have had. And it's important, um, you know, filling a house with smoke and attracting the police and the fire department is a small trauma. But, you know, I did learn that, you know, you keep windows open a little bit so you don't do that. But, but it's, 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 it's supposed to be a joyful journey even if it's painful so that, so that you know, understanding, you know, difficulties and working through them is, is amazing and and we all need to do it and and there are um realizations and and sometimes forgiveness that we have to give ourselves for sometimes putting ourselves through patterns that we know are repeats or difficult times that we walked into fully cognizant that it was difficult but it felt good so you know there's a there's an element of forgiving yourself and forgiving others and um becoming a whole or better person because of it all, and, and your book certainly um, gives people the tools to to to, to heal themselves and, and to face and, and deal with traumas that have happened in childhood and maybe even in adulthood. So it, it, it's an amazing book. I mean, I've read your other book, too. I like this one better. It seems to be pretty popular, so I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, you know, um, there's a lot more of you in this book. I mean, you certainly have wisdom to share. There's no doubt about that. But, but you know, when, when you're speaking of something that came from your own personal experience, it makes it a lot more real for the reader, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and sometimes spirit just tells you you have to write something because not that it's going to be 
necessarily, hopefully it will be, but it, it's not because it will be financially successful. It's, it, it will be personally enlightened. And, mm-hmm. and that certainly is the case here because you certainly, you even go through some of the stones that people can use to use for different aspects of healing, which I thought was a, another fascinating um, aspect that you covered. So there's a Good. little bit of everything here for sure. I don't mess but I around. Do wanna... no. <laughs> <laughs> you crammed a lot into those pages. You certainly did. And but what an education. So I, I got a question. Are you gonna hit any of the other archetypes or I mean there are a lot of the different archetypes you could kind of, you know, get into. You could have a whole series of your archetypal series of books. But see, I, 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 I'm not even looking at it as archetypes. I'm looking at, like, these are personalities that people have to deal with. So that wasn't even, like, well, an angle that I looked at. No, but 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 it is an angle that is there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and there are other, well, just call it personality types. Because um, mm-hmm. Because you have really covered these two beautifully. I mean, and and like I said, you know, I found myself a little bit here and a little bit there. So it's, it's I don't think anybody is totally any one particular type, but they have obviously, you know, a larger proportion of one than the other within them. But it was a mm-hmm. great book. It was a great Thank book, you. Dr. Rita. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and I so appreciate your being with us tonight. I uh, want to thank you again. Clock's ticking down here, and Blog Talk is not kind when they <laughs> shut me off. So <laughs> no. I, I'm going to get to the closing before they just cut it off. Um, thank okay. you again, and, and I look forward to thank your next you. book so that we can get together and talk again. Okay. Sounds great. Okie doke. Good night now. And good night, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us fully enjoyed this evening. I hope you did too. Check us out next week, Monday and Tuesday. We'll be back and uh, Mark has a great show and I have a fabulous show too. So we and check out the website barbaradelong.com and on there you can go to the YouTube channel and if you enjoy what you're listening to, please subscribe. Good night. <laughs>